Ladies and gentlemen, please find yourself a seat in that, uh, this audience here. We like to continue. We had a bit of a change in timing in the morning, but uh, we make up with a little bit shorter lunch break, uh, which is okay, we think, because the lunch will be served outside in a buffet style, so one hour should do, and we would not carry, we don't intend to carry the delay into the afternoon. Um, We'll start the three plenaries we have designed as a program committee in order to, to have the discussion Robert was announcing earlier on today, a discussion around uh, where we stand with Inspire somehow on the mid, during, during the midpoint of our way we have on Inspire. And uh, we have been clustering this into three uh, plenaries. This first plenary, which I'm happy to share, is looking at uh, well, under the title Government and Governance and Information, this first uh, plenary is looking at aspects uh, based on government experience and on citizen experience. We have then a panel tomorrow, which is called um, Governance at Crossroads, which is Inspires Crossroads, which is looking at uh, the questions there are in the middle of the process, how we shall be maybe modifying our measures in order to implement that we will discuss tomorrow. And on, on Friday, last but not least, we will look at the industry perspective, the private sector perspective, uh, the knowledge perspective uh, of our discussion. So, uh, a brief introduction. My name is uh, Stefan Jensen. On behalf of the European Environment Agency, I'm sharing here this uh, session. The EEA, as it has been mentioned, is one of the partners on the EU coordination on INSPIRE. And I would like to briefly introduce our four speakers, which we have here, or let's say the logic of the four, four talks we have here. We have with Jens krieger Royen, a representative of um, the Danish government, speaking about uh, how INSPIRE can grow and, and works together with the e-government plans in Denmark. That is very much underpinning what Hendrik told us in his introductory speech. Then we have Johannes Melles from Germany. He will introduce to us the marine data infrastructure, which is a rather broad initiative going out of the classical environment area into sectors, surrounding areas. Then we have a little swap. Uh, Jamila Shikankova from the Czech uh, Environmental Institute information agency, sorry. She will speak to us about the Czech experiences from a government perspective. And uh, Professor Muki Haklai from the University College of London will give us a presentation which very much focuses on the citizen aspects which we all have to take into account now. With this, I think I, I move the, the, the word to, to Jens. And please watch this announcement. At seven o'clock, we have that introduction some drinks, some small things to eat. We are hearing, so that goes away. And the question is, which is your present? Is that you? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, share with you the Danish uh, basic data program. Uh, I'm especially delighted to be here because, as uh, you probably all already uh, have picked up, uh, Inspire and Geodata means a lot in the Danish e-government uh, program on, uh, on basic data. Uh, what I would like to uh, use this opportunity to is to uh, shortly put the Danish basic data program into context. What kind of reform is it that we are working on? I will uh, uh, elaborate on shortly on what are the components of the basic data program. And then I will move over to a discussion on, uh, on the governance lessons learned from that uh, data management program. My name is uh, Jens Ryan. I'm a head of division at uh, the Danish Agency for Digitization, which is part of the Ministry of Finance. Uh, and you will probably hear in my speech I will talk about, uh, uh, I'll talk about the money, 
That's what we are doing this for. Uh, what, are the, what are the efficiency gains? What are the costs? What are the potentials? Where are we deriving the financing for? That's, that's the mechanics, that's the oil that makes uh, these initiatives go around, and that's what we are, that's what we are aiming for with the, this uh, program. Um, yes. Ten years of uh, e-government strategy in Denmark. Uh, we have a long tradition for uh, good and strong cooperation about uh, e-government in Denmark between the different uh, layers of, uh, of government. Uh, that's something that, we, uh, uh, that means a lot for us uh, working on the basic data program. We have a strong internal cooperation within the public sector, which is absolutely necessary and needed. We have a very strong uh, political mandate for the digitization in Denmark. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, digitization is seen by our government, by our prime minister, our, from our minister of finance, as digitization is one of the prime tools for making the public sector more efficient, deliver better service, and keep it modern and lean. So it's not, it's not fringe, it's not nerdy, it's uh, hardcore making this business of the public sector work. And that's why we're doing it. So we are running uh, for, to solve some of the big issues in government, which of course is uh, uh, austerity, we need to save money. It's a uh, lack of people, lack of hands, lack of skills, how do we handle that? It's competitiveness uh, for the Danish society in this uh, global world. How do we use digitization and a digital public sector to support these premier goal of, uh, of the government. And we also have a strong uh, cross-parliament uh, support for this uh, effort on the digitization. Uh, in the current uh, national strategy for digitization, we have uh, three main strands. Uh, the first one called no more printed forms and letters. Uh, you could also call it uh, uh, digital first. We are making it mandatory for citizens and businesses to communicate with the public sector in digital means and also to receive digital letters from uh, the government. Of course, there are some groups that are not, not able and they can be accepted, but by rule, it is digital by default and we are implementing that uh, large scale right now. The second strand is uh, new digital welfare. Uh, the big cost in a, in a vast welfare state as, as the Danish is, of course, uh, health, social, education, and we can use the modern technologies in much more innovative and effective ways to uh, deliver more service. It's not a question about saving money, that's hopeless, but to deliver more service with the same resources. We must use technology much more doing that. That's the second strand. The third strand, and that's where uh, uh, the program that I'm coordinating is uh, placed, is uh, closer digital co collaboration in the public sector. We are integrating the public sector much more uh, for the digital age, that is by legislation and very much by data. We have a growing understanding that what we are looking at, at in the next decade is the data-driven public sector a data-driven society. We have digitized almost all aspects of our public sector. We have an IT system everywhere. And what we're doing in this century is that we are hooking them up, making them uh, related, uh, make uh, cross-government uh, cross processes uh, automatic and uh, possible with huge gains. And I think actually this data-driven public sector is a common effort and one which also very much uh, underpin Inspire and we take this perspective to a whole of government and actually to a whole of society level. And that's where we, that's where we place the basic data program. 2012, as part of this uh, digital, new digital strategy, we made this uh, sibling, uh, good basic data for everyone, a driver for growth and efficiency, which is our uh, program foundation document for uh, the program that we're working on. And as the title said, we want to provide good basic data, good basic data as in good enough. You may ask what is good enough, and that's one of the key questions and a continued discussion. Uh, basic data, the data that everyone uses, that is important in many places in the public sector. 
You may ask, what is the precise definition of that? It has escaped us so far, but it's uh, very easy to know when you're talking about basic data or what should be basic data. And then finally, for everyone, we're seeing this as something that we're doing with a focus on the public sector, but we're doing this with a perspective on the whole of society. A driver for growth and efficiency, we see this as an important part of keeping the Danish society and the Danish businesses uh, competitive and productive in, uh, in the decades uh, to come. So, we had this uh, political agreement, 2012, that we should make this basic data program, and uh, that's uh, that's work that we are in the middle of right now. Just to delve into just a little bit more, what did the agreement said? Uh, we are making uh, investments of approximately 125 million uh, going to 2016. We uh, give open access to all these uh, basic data, uh, free, free open data, except the personal sensitive data, of course. Uh, we are establishing a common solution for distribution of these data. One of the things that we are handling in, in economically, technical and uh, legal aspects is availability, to ensure high availability of these basic data. I'll come back to more about why. We are making a series of initiatives in these areas, real property addresses, geographic, individuals and business data. I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, and very much importantly for the discussion that we're having now, we have established a cross-institutional -institu governance model. We have a basic data board which reaches across the state level, the main actors on the state level, and also the regional and the municipality level. So we have this common governance of the program of these initiatives where we try to coordinate and make these uh, initiatives uh, uh, be well coordinated. Uh, and we have uh, opened the door for that this may be a program that will expand uh, in the future. But currently we are busy making this uh, first batch uh, work. Uh, just a little bit more about what is, what is the basic data. Uh, it is basic data in, uh, in these uh, areas. It's uh, basic data about the individuals. Our uh, person's registration uh, are very important. Our Business registration uh, is, of course, extremely important. Real property, addresses, roads and areas, and maps and geography. In these areas we have defined, that's where we have the basic data, and the basic data are the most important, the very much used data in these areas. Uh, and we have more specific lists underneath, but that's our scope for the basic data program. Um, one of the key features of this drawing are the arrows between the different areas, because historically Denmark has a high level of quality in all of our registers, in our cadastra and our business registry and so forth. But these have been uh, silos, monoliths, uh, their own registry with their own legislation and their own formats and their own needs and they have been standing side by side. But when we, as Henrik Stusko mentioned, listen to the users, they say, we use your data in, uh, together. We, we have the job of trying to stitch your data together, and it sucks. It's really, really, really difficult, because you have different formats, you have di di uh, different licenses on how we may use it, you have uh, different technical models for distribution, and so forth. It's very, very difficult for us to use them in unison. So we have said, okay, we set out the ambition that we will create a basic data, a basic data set which holds all of these data and that they are coherent. So that's what the arrows between means, and that's, of course, one of the big data management challenges that we have in the basic data program, where we share a lot of challenges and opportunities with the Inspire program with what you're doing. So that's, uh, that's the basic data program in its scope, and then just to say, how do we, how do we look upon these data domains? What, what, what must they do in order to be good enough to be basic data? And uh, with a little insight, we have formulated these uh, five stars of basic data, which we hold up and look at our basic data areas and say, are they good enough? One, it must have sufficient quality to the major uses of data. Key here is 
we must understand the major uses of data and they must have sufficient quality. That is not stringent, that is not mathematically, that's not logically, but that shows the discussion that we have between the users who need the data and the producers who uh, provide the data and who have the cost. We have to balance the needs and the costs. So, sufficient quality, and it holds a millions of discussions into what is sufficient quality, and it is always uh, evolving. We have right now a big discussion about taxation on real property. We may need better data in order to have a better taxation, but then the need, then sufficient quality changes. So that's a political, technical uh, discussion that we're continually having. Sufficient quality. And it's a dialogue. Responsibility for keeping the basic data valid and up-to-date is clearly placed and efficiently handled. We are saying that these basic data are authoritative data. You must be able to rely upon them. You may be able to take action upon it immediately. Of course, then, you need to know who has the responsibility to uh, uh, keep it updated and valid, and it has to be founded in law. And that's actually a big exercise for us, to make sure that we have it founded in law or in strict agreements, so that we can ensure basic data quality. Basic data is semantically coherent and modeled accordingly to the model rules of basic data. Of course, in this room, you understand what that means. You understand that that is a very big undertaking. Uh, we see this as one of our prime, uh, prime ambitions and uh, prime challenges. But we, under we see these arrows and the, uh, the connections between the data set as ultimately important in order to extract value. And of course, that is what we're doing this for, is extracting value. So we have to make the data semantically coherent. And in order to, that, to do that, uh, we have uh, made a cookbook, uh, how to model your data. Uh, there are many, many good ways to do it, but we need to be uh, firm upon one agreed common way to do that, and that's one of the uh, big works uh, that we have right now. And if you're interested, you uh, can hear more about uh, these model rules uh, this afternoon in uh, uh, in the session on Inspire Models and Modeling, we will describe uh, the cookbook that we have made here. Basic data is available for free and with non-restrictive terms. Of course, that's part of the access and the value creation. And we need to make sure that it is used everywhere where it generates value. So we have a very strong promoting role, and that is not just uh, Advertising the possibilities, it is also uh, hard legislative works, it is uh, uh, tough budgetary uh, discussions with ministries and agencies in order to make sure you must use these basic data which we have invested in because it has some potential and you must lay down your own copies. So that's what we're doing here. So that is the scope that we have put up. And for each of these areas, we have put this lens up and seen what must be done in order to uh, derive here for the basic data. And this... I just... Yeah, I think I'll just skip that and just say um, we are, that's, that's where we are right now. We have defined the project catalogs for each of these basic data areas described here, was, what must be done, uh, registries must be reorganized, data must be moved, we have to make data wash, improve data quality here and here and here, uh, we have to remodel our data here and here. We are in the middle of this implementing process of the basic data program, started uh, last year, 2013, we are in year two, and our ambition is to have realized the projects and the ambitions set out here by 2016. Just a few uh, core components. Uh, the data distributor, I mentioned that we are making a common infrastructure for making these data available. Uh, that has very much to do that we are viewing these data as a part of a, an infrastructure, an infrastructure which in the digital age must be highly available. And one of the accessibility issues is the technical availability. We could see that we would be putting out very high performance uh, demands on the uh, different registries, which would be inhibitedly expensive. So we said, maybe it will be more efficient, 
more uh, cost effective to build one common data distributor which can take these data in and which can put them out in a vast capacity and with uh, exceedingly high, uh, uh, high performance. So we are building a high performance data distributor as a common component in, uh, in the Danish e-government. Uh, it will be uh, online by 2015 and uh, fully operational by 2016. And we see this as one of the uh, infrastructure cornerstones of e-government uh, going forward. As I said, we are redesigning and integrating the data models with uh, an ambition about having put, be able to put out the basic data across all these domains as one data model where the user does not have to be interested in where are the data coming from, who has made them, uh, how do they model their data. We're doing it in one common way so that we can integrate these data. Um, some of the key government traits, governance traits, and I say, uh, I think many of the things I have mentioned you, uh, you understand very well because we have drawn very much upon Inspire when uh, we formulated the basic data program. We started the Inspire principles, I think in the, in the five stars of the basic data program, you recognize the basic, uh, uh, the Inspire principles and the Inspire thinking. Uh, it is, it is of uh, big importance for us, and also in our modeling rules, we are uh, taking as much from Inspire as we probably can. Uh, I'll say, say to you, and uh, as I have said to the Danish uh, agency of uh, geodata, you are some of the most capable of data management uh, in, uh, in the public sector. Um, this is a new, very, very important discipline in the public uh, sector. Not very many are good at it. The agencies of taxation are better at it than most uh, because they have many data, uh, but none, none are as good as you are. That's one of the reasons that we're drawing a lot of uh, inspirations from you in uh, data management. Key government traits, governance traits in the Danish basic, uh, Danish basic data program embedded in a tradition of strategic and operational cooperation that is very much necessary. This is not a technical endeavor. This is about a lot of, lot of people, a lot of institutions that has to align about a common goal uh, and common standards and common methods. This is a change program, not a technical program. It is sponsored by the highest political level and governed by a high-level board. Uh, we have seen just in our program that we are hitting many roadblocks which we cannot just uh, handle by, by talking, but where we also need to uh, uh, have some hard-nosed discussions and also take some unpopular decisions. You need to have a mandate to, uh, to clear the roadblocks that you meet, otherwise it takes so lot long time. It must be guided by business cases and public sector efficiency gains. The only way that we can keep momentum and interest and remove the roadblocks is by the importance of this. Not for uh, some perspective, but for some very, very important near-term economical gains. Also long-term ec economical gains. But we have to show the business case. We made the financing up front. Uh, this whole program was financed in 2012, all our activities are financed, which means that we don't have to stop and discuss the financing, also extremely important, uh, and I know very, very difficult. One of the things that I think is remarkable is that with the ba Danish Basic Data Program, we, are not really, we haven't really found some new problems. Almost all the problems that we have solved and made agreements about was long-standing issues well known and many of the solution was also well known but we needed a framework to come together and solve these uh, in the same time uh, authoritative data and simplification are uh, main design principles and actually we are redesigning our registries from these perspectives so we are going in redesigning the registries changing the laws uh, from uh, from doing this and we have this program organized by data domains, not by institutions. So we have the view in by the data, not by the institutions, and try to uh, overcome the institutional barriers. Yes, sorry. Uh, governance, extremely important. I'll say no more about that. Uh, where the money comes from, ask me later. Um, <laughs> then I know I'll get questions. Data reforms requires deep coordination. 
must be driven by a strong, clear business case and have sufficient mandate. This is very, very difficult and has so many layers from semantics to law to institutions to budgets. And you have to, make, you have to be able to coordinate the whole stack, otherwise you will get stuck. That's what we have experienced, also the hard way. We need to balance the need for the common overview and uh, uh, the autonomy of the d different registries, and we have to have a vision and a goal that is simple, large, and holds something for everybody. And now my last statement. <laughs> Our goal, which we are trying to set forth and which we uh, see is uh, engaging people, is that we're trying to make an efficient and a coherent basic data infrastructure for all that is underpinning a data-driven public sector. And when we get people on board on this vision, many things can happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Jens, for making this uh, explanation how we find Inspire being really nested in your, your e-government strategy. We'll, we'll have a question probably later. Now we have to move on to Johannes, please. Uh, to, uh, to hear about uh, the marine data infrastructure. Thank you very much, Johannes. Okay. Just. Can I give you a hand on that? I'll just close this one. And down there. Okay. Um, Microphone is running. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm also very delighted uh, to, that I have the, uh, the chance to give a presentation here on our uh, marine data infrastructure, which we, are uh, which we have set up in, in Germany. And um, so it's more coming from a practical side. So we are re we've really, we were really coming from the doing side. We are setting up an infrastructure where we would like to bring data together from different agencies on the federal state level and on the governmental level. You, maybe you know a little bit about the structure in Germany. We have a uh, federal state and we have the governmental level and they have different responsibilities for the data and that makes life, uh, if it comes to data, sometimes very complicated. And uh, so, yeah, that's why we said, okay, we would need something like a common data infrastructure along the coast because we have quite a lot of things to do with this data. Um, I, before I go into the system itself, I would like to give um, a short. Uh, I would like to show you some some slides about the motivation. Why why do we do this? If you if you look at uh, at the German coast, it's a, a fairly small area compared with other countries. Um, so we have our EEZ and the, uh, the, the coastal waters is not too big, but we have 18 agencies which are responsible for data in this area. 18 uh, uh, agencies which are producing data within the EEZ and the coastal waters. And um, so we have to bring all these, uh, these agencies coming from different uh, levels of administration uh, under one umbrella. And that was, that was a big task we had to fulfill. So, um, first thing was to bring the data together, but we also were looking in what, what, what do we need that data for? What, what do we want to do with this data? It's, uh, so, one, one thing I already uh, brought that up is, is Inspire, obviously. So, we have, we have to provide services and uh, viewing services and download services and so on and so on for Inspire, but that's not all. We also have the Law of the Sea conventions in, uh, in, the, in the North Sea and in the, in the Baltic Sea, where we have to provide data to. That's OSPA and Helcom. And another big framework directive, uh, directive which is uh, causing especially our environmental agencies uh, quite a lot of headache these days, uh, is the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And uh, so these are, from, our, from my perspective, these are the, the, the more important uh, systems where we have to provide data to, but we have a few more, and you can see. Uh, I just uh, I don't know if this uh, if this list is complete. I, I just added what came into my mind where we have to provide data to. So, and if you really have to cover all these different systems, uh, then it is 
is not possible if, if uh, these individual agencies uh, do it on their own. You need a common system uh, to do this. You, you really have to combine forces uh, to, to, to provide data to these systems. Um, yeah, as you heard, as you already have seen, we, I'm coming from the, from the wet side, uh, not from the dry side. It's uh, so um, quite a lot of people. Um, I don't want to go through the, through this list with you. If you. Everybody knows that, but quite a lot of people just think, okay, uh, if you go to marine uh, areas or to the seas. Uh, where is the, where is spatial data in these areas? There's, there's uh, quite a lot of people really uh, say, okay, we have hydrography, and then uh, define an area, put a name to this area, and that's it. But and in the in, at, as a minimum, we already have these two uh, themes within within the Inspire um, directive: uh, oceanographic, geographical features, and sea regions. But what, that's definitely not all. What we all had to address in, in our marine data infrastructure in Germany was all of this. Everything which is already marked green here on the screen, that is something we have to address also on the wet side. It is really, we have to provide data for quite a lot of different themes there as well. And that is what we identified in our project MDI, or in our system MDI-IDE. There are other uh, agencies as well, and we we are not sure about these uh, orange ones. If some of them, at least, we, I'm pretty sure that we have to address them. But and if you then look at the list, there are only uh, five themes left, which uh, are not addressed by the marine side. So it's what I want to I wanted to make the point that okay, the marine side also has to provide really a lot of data to to inspire and. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a quite big community with a big data sets with a lot of data. Okay, a few uh, major things with our, with our project. So um, MDID stands, as already mentioned before, for Marine Data Infrastructure in Germany. And uh, it is a supra-international supra, supra network uh, for the integration of marine data from all relevant data sources. And relevant data sources in Germany means that is the national institutions and the federal institutions. And we also would like to add uh, scientific data, which is coming from, from the research organizations. And uh, so that means we have these three levels of data which are coming into the system. The system itself should form the national marine and coastal information system. So. Um, it has a central geo portal where you can uh, look at the data, where you can download the data, and so on and so on. Then we have a central metadata catalog. We have uh, local, local infrastructures, uh, infrastructure nodes, which are providing the data. So it's, it's very similar to the approach which was chosen by, by Inspire. You have local, uh, um, more or less small SDIs, or spatial data infrastructures, which provide then uh, services to a Central or not, not central to a um, yeah let's say it's to a point in the middle where, where they collect all these things where bring the, these brings bring these things together and make it useful useful or usable uh, for the for the for the user. Okay, we started off in 2010. Uh, the project was funded by the German Ministry of Education and Research for for three years, and uh, since uh, April this year. We have a cooperation arrangement between all the partners, that means between the federal states and, and the governmental agencies. So that uh, gives us at least uh, some, some financial basic, ba uh, basis where we can uh, really go on. Um, this is the network it is, as it stands now. We already have quite a lot of, quite of, lo quite a lot of uh, agencies involved in this, in this business. Uh, so we have... Um, if you look, look around here, we have these different nodes. These are all little infrastructures uh, which were set up within the project and where, where people produce data, make that data available uh, within the, the complete MDI-DE system. So that is... Uh, then we have a, a central portal. We have services we are harvesting, the metadata. So the metadata uh, will be produced by each individual 
um, node, and uh, we're just uh, taking this data and making it in a central metadata catalog available. So, and we have other things like Thesaurus and Gazetteer and uh, things like that. So, yeah, this is the network we've set up, and uh, it's an open network. Everybody who has, can provide data to such a system here is an open node. Uh, with which allows, if, if the people follow the rules, then they just easily can join and easily can provide data by using MDIDE. Okay, I would uh, come to one point uh, we, where we made some experience during this project or during this uh, setting up the system in data infrastructure. Eutrophication. Eutrophication, for some of the people around here, may uh, make some um, sense. Uh, is, is one of the descriptors in, within the M Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And uh, so what I said in the beginning is this is quite a big problem for the federal agencies. And so it became one high-level task within our, within our project to provide data to this, uh, to this uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And um, so we had to face the problem of uh, interoperability between the data, harmonization of data. Um, the, the, the data was uh, produced by, in this case, by, by uh, five different uh, organizations, and they all have their own data set. They use, they use their own way of measuring the data, they use their own way of uh, uh, presenting the data, they use their own way of uh, uh, they have their own limits for, the, for, for some, some values and so on and so on. That was uh, quite, quite complicated to bring these, all, all these things together. And we are a little bit proud because now we have, uh, we've, we've managed to, to come up with a, a, uh, with a completely harmonized data set. This is just the example for nitrate N. Uh, it's, it is not just nitrate N, it's all the indicators which are needed for, for the for the, for the descriptor uh, beautification. We've done all this um, harmonization for, this full, for, for the full data set there. And if you look at this, this data is okay, it's only simple uh, magenta points, but these simple magenta points really mean something because they are comparable, they're using the same methodology, methodology and uh, they are using the same limits and so on. So that is uh, quite nice and was a very important exercise we had to go through. So because we had to bring the people together. And this, I, don't be afraid, I don't want to explain UML diagrams to you. Uh, this is just a, a symbol for me. Um, a symbol which uh, tells me, okay, we, what we also have tried to, to use Inspire. Inspire, the, the, the Inspire um, common data model uh, to, to produce a web feature service for, uh, for the MSFD. So, and in this case, it, again, it's eutrophication, and we had really taken um, yeah, models from, from the Inspire uh, data model and uh, have uh, changed them or added things to it so that we really can cover the full data which is needed for the MSFD. So that was, I think it was a quite good test how these Inspire um, models work and if they could be used for, for other directives like MSFD or Water Framework Directive. Um, because this, uh, in, in the directive, it only states uh, the data has to be Inspire compliant. And think, I think that's too simple. You have to give the people some guidelines how to do that. Um, okay, a quick, quick look into the system. That's our, that's our portal. The portal uh, allows you to search for data. It allows you to visualize the data and you can access the data. Um, if you really want to look into it, uh, this is the URL. It's, uh, www.mdi-de.org, and uh, yeah, you're welcome to look into it and uh, have a further uh, further view into into the data sets. Um, this is an example out of I, I've, I was told not to show too much about content and technique and things like that, but I wanted to show this example because this is data which is used in our, in, in our office, in our agency, for spatial planning. So, and uh, in these days, wind farms and wind parks are really 
that's what people want to do in the EEZ, that's what they do want to do offshore. And uh, to do that, they have to get the approval from our agency uh, that they can do it in certain areas. And this is what, what we use to give them the approval. And this data is also used by companies and uh, the private sector to, to provide information to us uh, where to build things and uh, how does it uh, conflict with other things. We have, it's, uh, it's, if you compare with Google, it's not too much, but we have about half a million clicks on this, uh, this data set every month. That is, um, I think, for a, a, a data set which is coming from a very a specific community, that's quite, quite a lot, I would say. So that's why I just wanted to have a quick look into this data. We have an, our second one is, uh, is our geological data along the, along the German coast. So there we have sediments and all that stuff. Bo and you can add where does this data come from, bo profile lines, boreholes, and so on. Um, another thing, if you talk about marine data, uh, it's uh, quite often we are looking into a a fourth dimension, because we are, it's, it's the data is, or is the, 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 the medium we are working with, water, body, and all things is dynamic. So that means we have to, to keep the time domain uh, in, into account as well, and that is quite difficult to represent that in a two-dimensional way. It's, uh, it's uh, quite difficult to bring that into a map style somehow. And therefore, these people who work with this data quite often, they like, they like uh, Having, having uh, diagrams. They have, like to have vertical profiles, horizontal profiles, or here is a horizontal profile. It's not the time dependency, but a depth dependency in here. Um, that is a, a temperature profile through the Baltic Sea, so that is quite, quite nice. Uh, if you would like to get more information about uh, our system, you're welcome to look into our website. It's embedded into the, into the portal. So you can just, just use the same URL. Uh, but I have to admit, uh, it's, at this stage, it's only available in German, but we are working on, the English, so on, on an English version of it, and so it will be available very soon. Um, so, yeah. Um, what was the experience we've made within this uh, project or within setting up this system? So, uh, the first thing I'm, I'm bringing up here is organization versus technology. So we've, we've made the, uh, we recognize technology is fairly easy. It is, uh, you, you really um, need the computer experts, you, need, you can log into the, into, the, into the data stuff and things like that. The, more, the bigger problem is how to organize this. The bigger problem is how to bring the people under one umbrella, how to, how to work together and how to come to a, a common thinking in, 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 in doing things. So how to follow common principles, as you quite often uh, state in, in the Inspire context. So that was, was one of the big things. And we had to learn within the project because we, in the beginning when we started off, we said, oh man, a big, big technical issue. And, uh, but uh, then we had we recognized, okay, we have to do much more work on the, on the organization. So partners have to be on the same level, uh, on the technology side and the thinking, well, that's what I said. Uh, harmonization, I already uh, stressed that in one of my slides before. Licensing of data, it's, uh, it's one of the big issues again. Uh, there are still quite a lot of people around who want to make some money with their data, who want, really want to earn money with the data, and um, they are like, I was quite impressed by the present presentation from our Danish colleagues this morning, um, that it has, has some value for the economy, even if you, if you really give the data away for free. You, don't, you, you get more out of the data when you get it, give it away for free. And for us, it is quite important uh, that uh, we are really trying to work towards uh, getting uh, open data and free data in, in such a system. Yeah. And uh, it was also mentioned quite often already today that uh, the user requirements, the user has to come into play uh, much more as he has been in the past. The user is defining what, what is needed, the user has, has, to, has to really define what, what kind of information do we need to do things. 
Another thing is, the last point on this slide, and then I jump over my two next slides, <laughs> um, is, yeah, it's quite, quite helpful if you really have a use. If you say, okay, like what I presented before, if you say this data set which is used for, for um, giving the approval or doing the spatial planning in, in the EEZ, this means this data is, has a very specific use, and they really can tell you, uh, for this use, I need this and this and this and this and this information. That is, from my, from my point of view, that is very, very important. If you really have a task where you want to go to with this data, then it's, uh, that is quite, quite helpful, and then, then people are motivated, and people really can see where, where is this going to. If you... Uh, theoretical use cases, from our point of view, are not really not sufficient. So you really need a task: what to do with the data. Okay. Uh. <laughs> okay. So that was a quick jump. <laughs> I can I, now. I want to make my, make my last point here, the last slide, and then I stop. Um, I think we have a lot of criticism on on uh, how Inspire works. People really uh, yeah, arguing with a lot of things. Uh, the guideline, technical guidelines are too complicated, nobody understands it, and uh, things like that. But what I really see is Inspire has, was a big boost uh, for spatial data in, in Europe. So it, was really, it has brought this topic, uh, spatial data, forward, really heavily forward. Without Inspire, I think we would... Uh, would be in a situation that a lot of people wouldn't have started to think about spatial data, and that quite a lot of countries wouldn't be able to provide data in the required way. Uh, so, my last point, Inspire has finished the first step, it's reached, it has reached the version 1.0. 1.0, we are somewhere in the beginning of the process. And a lot of people have put a, put a lot of efforts into it, uh, to set up a system as good as possible, but it could be only the first step. Inspire has to be a living system, it has to evolve, and it has to evolve according to the requirements of the user. And, uh, yeah, that was my final comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johannes. You covered a lot of ground. That was excellent. And we have uh, a lot of input also to our discussion of points to take into consideration for the future. We have to move on. Jamila uh, goes next, please, with uh, the presentation from the Czech perspective. And uh, that is that one? Is it that one? Is it that one? Okay, good morning or good afternoon already, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm representing now the, the Czech Environmental Information Agency and the Czech ANET network, being uh, currently uh, the NFP for the, the, in the ANET network in the Czech Republic. Some of you may uh, know me, then they recognize that I'm not Czech, but I have been living in, among Czechs and with them uh, so for such a long time that I dare to speak as one of them now. So uh, let me start from, from the wider context. Uh, you may uh, notice this already. If you ask uh, anywhere in the, in the world, how are you, you will get uh, the very polite courtesy answer, fine. If you ask in the Czech Republic, you will get a different answer probably not from the colleagues sitting here in this room because they are very well trained in the intercultural communication and they know what to expect. But usually in the Czech Republic, if you ask how are you, you the people starting to explain very deep details from their private life, uh, explaining troubles from their uh, children, parents, car, jobs, everything. Uh, so you, you may be confused from this answer, but uh, Czechs are really very direct and if you ask directly how are you, they explain how are they nowadays. So just for explanation, that uh, asking different answers, you may also uh, get the unexpected uh, answers. So let's start with the question regarding INSPIRE. If you ask about the transposition of uh, INSPIRE directive, then we can speak uh, a lot about months and months of work 
uh, of technical and legal experts. Uh, then uh, we can speak also about the uh, an interrupting about troubles making from by the politicians, and also we finally uh, thought we uh, transpose the directive uh, successfully, but we we get a notification from, from the commission that, is in, that our transposition is incomplete. We tried to explain that it's just uh, uh, just misunderstanding. We just use different terminology and different translation, but nevertheless. We, uh, finally, we got the uh, announcement that we are in an infringement in the beginning of this year. So the question whether we are successful or not, uh, you know, we think yes, but the Commission probably will think in a different way. As regards the implementation, so that's the other story. We can also start to think uh, or to speak about the uh, uh, about the, the metadata and the data, about the indicators we provide uh, to the Commission regarding the implementation. And we, uh, if we say, uh, if we think about the metadata, we can see the, the huge extent of metadata, also with the huge extent of use of services. It's an example from the cadaster uh, data. As regards the data, we also had a quite large involvement in data specification testing. Still some harmonization still at ask, but Nevertheless, and as regards the stakeholders, we have uh, plenty of contacts in the Inspire mailing list, and we also have, uh, for, for such a small country like the Czech Republic is, so we had also uh, plenty of responses for the Inspire evaluation of questionnaire. So, success story? Yes, but I have learned from, from the uh, new general director of the EA that the disagreement should be, should be present, not yes, but, but yes, yes, and. So now it's a yes end. But was the problem we see that Inspire uh, so far uh, in, uh, on our level is still not implemented because the government wants it. There is no pressure from the government side that they need the data and that they need to have them Inspire compliant. It's just because the Commission wants it. So what's the problem? Does the government don't need the data for making policy? Of course they need We hope they, they need the data. <laughs> And do we offer them the right data? Of course, we, we, are, we are experts, you know, we know the, what, what, they, <laughs> what they need for us, so yes. So what's the problem? Do we offer the data in the right form? Maybe this is the way uh, how to speak about it. So let me have an example. I have a product here. Do you want it? You don't know, because you don't know what is inside. So I have to describe it precisely, so I did. So do you, do you know, do you want it? You still don't know, because uh, if, you are, if you don't have a, the master degree in chemistry, you probably don't want what the hell it is. So, even if it is very precisely in standardized form described. So, whenever I see this, <laughs> do you want it? <laughs> still not, probably, but from this moment, you can clearly recognize the use, uh, user group who will use it, and the, those user group, if you, if you offer it, then they will use it exactly in the, in the form they should do. So, uh, we have several groups of our users. We have needs, and we also have the uh, capability of use. So, in the, in the bottom level, we have GIS experts, which, which are, they are very capable, and they, they can use Inspire complaint data services, everything in a perfect form. But do they need it? Yes, probably, but only if all those uh, groups up, uh, about them want it. Otherwise, they will just play with the toast. They, they, know that they don't need them from themselves. As regards the research, some of researchers probably trained uh, or even educated in, in uh, spatial technology, so they can use the, the spatial data uh, in the Inspire compliant form, but most of them probably not. As regards the politicians, so do you know any politician able to use G ArcGIS or, or any other tools? Probably someone from the Pirate Party, but there are only a few of them. So, and as regards the public, there's the same story. So there are really uh, some misconception between the needs and the use. So what's with this? Needs versus offer. I can see it in this way. We offer our the, the need is the chair. Someone needs a chair to relax or to, to look at the FIFA uh, World Championship. And what we offer is this way. So, <laughs> this is the way 
so everybody can make a chair in this way, for someone is able, but someone not. So we are not in the wrong way, really. It's just what we offer is just not enough. The key and the manual and the box is not enough for everybody to be relaxed. So what is enough? Enough, what we think it's enough, enough there we have applications which are not simple, they are advanced, but they are simple for the end users how to use them, to be able to, uh, to offer the right, right data in the form the users need them. So of course, this is nothing which, which we in the Czech Republic have discovered last week, as uh, we have, uh, or all, many of us uh, are involved in the, in the many projects, uh, thinking in the same way. Let me have an example. We had an ACES project several years ago when we created the, the, back, uh, the not best, the good practices catalog. Uh, then we have also, the, the, for example, the Smith Park project when we invited and encouraged the private companies to be involved in the NISPAR and use it for their commercial uh, solutions and application. We have an Innova Plus project when we try to, to grab all the um, results and um, tools uh, coming from the past project and try to make an infrastructure for this and many, many other projects. So one, just one example from the Czech Republic, I will not speak about it so much, it was, just, it was an application which we developed through our national Inspired Geo portal, we called it GeoReport, and this is very simple uh, uh, application, simple for use, very uh, advanced uh, for us, for, for, the, for Inspire uh, experts. So this is application which allow user to uh, uh, get the information of for uh, solving real life situation. For example, there is a situation, there's different uh, environmental topics. We have, for example, this is the water. So if, if you, as a citizen, for example, wants to build a well near your house, then you have uh, to, to solve a lot of administrative problems, you need a lot of information, how to do it, uh, to whom ask, to, to whom ask for the permission, and, and, and everything else. So uh, this, tool allow you just answer very several very simple questions and will give you all the necessary information. So run the report, building the well, you can see the picture even you don't understand check. So the only uh, thing you have to do is answer the several very simple questions. First of all, click on the map where your house is, where the well should be built. Then several other questions with the well, how it is big, and so on. So several other questions, and then the report is uh, is being processed, and the user will get this is a part part of the report. It's a PDF format with the map and all the necessary information. The information uh, comes from uh, a very deep GIS analysis, which is behind this. But the user doesn't recognize, even don't recognize that there's any GIS data behind it. Just he give. He gives an, an information and he's happy. So uh, we, uh, we developed this, pro, this uh, tool within the National Inspired Geo Portal. Now with, uh, within the Innova Plus project, we try to extend it as a cross-border uh, application just to be able to use it also in the Czech Republic. So it also is not simple. There are many troubles regarding this, but I'm not spent so much time. If you want, we can speak it about. So from uh, my perspective, Inspire is not the goal, Inspire is the way. So, and Inspire is the way for making state administration successful, transparent, consistent. What is our goal is to provide our uh, administration officers, our politicians with the data, which are transparent, consistent, and in the form they can use them. So, focus on our users, which is my main uh, message from, from today. So let me arrive back from the beginning of my presentation. So if you do not ask us how we are, unless you want really to want to know very deep details from my current private life. Otherwise, think about the different. So 
And the same way, we should think about the same way, don't, don't ask whether we have implemented Inspire, otherwise you will, you will uh, hear something about the infringement, political troubles and whatever. Whatever, maybe try to think about the different question, whether, whether we have satisfied our users by implementing Inspire. Maybe this is the right question we should uh, answer now. So, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a plenty of satisfied users, and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Jamila, for this extremely illustrative presentation. A uh, lot of interesting points, also on the legal side. I wonder how the lawyers can digest that, but uh, we come to that in another context. Last presentation, last but not least, Muki will tell us about uh, a bit a new angle, which you yeah. can read all over there. And crowdsourcing. Go ahead. So this presentation is made together with Claire Elul, Dr. Claire Elul from UCL, who is my local Inspire expert. And we kind of decided that, that as something towards lunch, it needs to be a bit of provocation. So think about the other aspect. What, we, what I will kind of cover very quickly is an argument that there were three eras of access and use of environmental information. And the third era, which we are just entering, is actually creating a, a challenge that needs to be thought through and integrated into a new area. So I'll start by describing those eras very quickly. Then I'll move to describing a bit this whole area of crowdsourced geographic information and citizen science and look at the challenges for Inspire Framework. So when environmental information started somewhere in 1969, around the 70s, and the kind of end period is a bit shifty, you had expert, you had decision maker, and you had the public. And the view was that experts should deal with the information and the public should just listen and do what they are being told. So there were conflict between experts, but inherently what you wanted is information that passed between experts and the public can then get some of the information. So experts are responsible for creating and using environmental information, the top-down attitude to decision-making, and something called information deficit model, that if the public would have known what the expert known, then they would do exactly what the expert want. So environmental information is for the expert and by the expert. The second era is kind of opened up things, and because of all kind of changes, especially, you know, 1992 is the real conference, you'll see in a second, uh, we also have the opening up of the data to the public. So the second era is what we know as Principal 10 in Rio Conference, and the Hours Convention, and public access to environmental information is critical to participation in decision-making, and we're becoming really the important tool to deliver this information, but still, information is by expert, created by expert, and then released to the public but in an expert language. So if you want to figure out what's going on, read what, what uh, the expert wrote. And by the way, if you want the full argument, you find at the bottom the URL that gives you the full discussion of these eras. The third era which we are entering now is actually that the production of the information now moved to the public too. And the point is that there, these eras are a bit like Russian dolls. We got the first era, this kind of expert creating information, inside the second era, which is also inside the third one. So we are not, it's not kind of, we move to the third one and we forget about the other things. They are all continuing together. So if you look from Inspire perspective, Inspire very clearly is in this area, in expert talking to expert and sharing information. Inspire is also within the hours convention and other things. But what about that? what we are going to do with that area. And that's what I'm going to start covering. So, this image is from 2006, but for in 2004, a guy was sitting in a home in London and decided that he is going to create a map of the world and because he had access to uh, computing at UCL, started a server, and this, what you see in 2006, is the beginning of OpenStreetMap. And the important thing is that by 2006, these guys could show, and it's mainly guys, there is a gender bias going on there, and you can see in the picture, um, that within one weekend, you go to an area and you change it from what you see in the bottom to what you see on the other side. 
And that's what we have today here around us. Now, we now have 10 years of mapping of the whole world, but the paradigm of creating the information is very different because inherently you don't have anyone to call. There is an organization called OSM Foundation. Go to the website, you won't find telephone number. You will even find that there is no one employed. So this kind of paradigm of creating information by an organization that then delivers the information you can put on them regulation or ask them to do things is just not there. And while there are examples of transferring OSM data now into Inspire compliant data, and there are really lovely things going on around, we need to also think on the organizational aspect that changed dramatically. But it's also changed around the environmental information itself. So that's a citation from Jackie McGlade, who was then the head of the European Environment Agency, and saying that the information should come from citizens, because often the best information comes from those who are closest to it, those that got access to it. And indeed, one of the first projects that she launched at the same day was Water Watch, which is structured information gathering from the public about uh, water quality. But that is just part of this whole phenomena of citizen science, which, because of the internet, is now sometimes called citizen cyber science. And it's got implications for biological observation, for using computers in a distributed way, for people classifying different things, for people doing DIY science, and other aspects. But let me focus specifically on aspects that are relevant here. So, this is an organization in the U.S. called the Public Lab, who, who are creating tools for capturing imagery. So you buy a kit for about $100 or something like that, and you go around your neighborhood and you create high-resolution imagery. And in this case, for example, think about the construction of this road in Jerusalem. The people in the neighborhood are capturing the image at the right time, and if you want to go back and analyze the information, you will need to figure out where this is. And this data is by a community organization. In this case, you got the public lab, but the people that actually collected the information are not coming from a very specific structure. Or another example of work that we've done in London about air quality, we've been using diffusion tubes. They are in the standard, they are being used since the 70s, they are recognized as a policy tool. But because we now can go and buy them cheaply and analyze them cheaply, we could spread them in the neighborhood and start creating a specific map. Now, from the community perspective, that's very valuable to make a case for the, for the government. But this data can be valuable for a lot of other things. Or another example is noise, which we will look at. So this is a project from 2008 where we were using a mo a mobile monitors, which stand actually a very similar uh, standard to many other tools that you find by professionals. But by 2012, we already had it as an app that you can download to your phone and you can start using. And through a workshop around Heathrow, we could start collecting the data, and this is what it looked when we started it, and within a year, we got thousands of measurements from many members of the communities, and then that data, we will see in a minute what the problem that we are creating. But this stuff is not just me saying the whole community are doing that bottom-up all over the place. It's actually part now of the European Environment Agency work program, where it explicitly says that part of the uh, topic that will be covered are initiative concerning lay local traditional knowledge and citizen science. That's the stuff that is coming in. And of course will come the, the data quality issue, which you know, came also in the morning. But what we have to remember is that we need to think differently about these things. All kind of assumptions that we had when we worked inside organizations don't work anymore. You actually want duplication, because that helps you to get verification. You do want to have multiple applications on different phones, because different people will prefer to use different tools. You also want to have different methods to do your quality assurance, and they will be very different from what you used to. So ISO standard just 
are not fit for purpose for this type of data. So here's the challenge. You want to create the, this, the story with the metadata is that we want this, all this data, but there is, of course, lack of expertise. There are lots of people that are coming from lots of walks of life. There are also limitations in production, so that, that the data itself is complex. The, the metadata, you need no guidelines on how much data you, is enough, uh, difficult to understand. It's held in a lot of non-standard format, and we'll see in an example very soon what it creates. You have also the issue of how the metadata and the data are not in the same place or not connected in the same way, which means especially look at the third point about citizen science. People will think about what they want to collect. They will do the data and the metadata according to what makes sense of the project. Even if they are working in a governmental organization, not necessarily they'll know about Inspire or what metadata should be there. And that's the coupling, is, we'll see in a minute, we create issues with that. Of course, it's also the issue of metadata not used by uh, end users, and all this understanding of qu data quality and fitness for purpose is important. And finally, the uh, use of it, when someone wants to use it, uh, you first of all have the whole issue of the presentation not used. Um, so what people need to know is, is, can they reuse it and can they combine it with other sources? Or what do we do with all the derived data? And what happened with the citizen science and crowdsourcing is that the multiplication or the language that is used there, forking of data set, is very, very common. And bringing them together and figuring out what to do with that is a challenge. So let's look at the scenario. You are an environmental consultant or, let's say, a community activist that want to get the data and you want to get information about an area of London called Deptford. You don't have specific GIS training or expertise, so you never heard about Inspire. And you identify three maps of noise, all online, all available to you, and now you want to choose which one you're going to choose from. So let's move back to era one, and we see three data sets. Data set A, it's very clear to you that it's created by a community organization. Data set B, coming from the uh, Department of Environment and Rural Af Food and Rural Affairs, so government body. C came from a European project that I showed you earlier, everywhere. If we are in era one or era two, what we say is that B, of course, is authoritative, C may be next to it, and come on, I'm not going to use something that came from a community. You're starting to try and figure out, but you're, you don't know all these things, and you're trying to find authority. So what you notice is that there is some data missing. Uh, you know, there is data about Deptford, about the area in all the maps, but it doesn't cover the whole area. There are gaps, and there are more gaps in, uh, you notice probably in A and C, but, you know, B, the government one, looks very homogeneous. All of them, when you look at the legend and try to understand the information, all look like they give you the information about where is the high level of noise, something like 70 dBA. So then you start diving in and you're trying to understand things. You then discover that map B is actually not based at all on actual measurement. What's more, it's actually saying on the tin that you shouldn't use it for that purpose. So off gone the authoritative data. Then we look at C. C doesn't have metadata coming with it because it's a European project. But you do notice that once you look into it, you see things like, for example, the date when it was taken, you see the place, you see all sorts of information about where it, it, it is. But what you don't see and what you won't find immediately is, for example, this type of information. The fact that the community map information was taken by these noise meters that were bought in a local hardware shop, and actually they are quite good because we know we tested them in the lab later on. Then there are different apps that are running and you can download on your phone. NoiseTube, the one uh, that you see over there, in the, that one, is the only one that got internal calibration. And even that just for specific phones. So the likelihood that most people that use it haven't used it calibrated. The Environment Agency Noise Watch is not calibrated. And white noise, the one that was used in everywhere, 
you can see the graph over there about the performance in the lab compared to a type A, class A, a noise meter. So which one do you trust? Turn out that the community one is the most trustworthy information about your area. Now, that is going to happen more and more. And it's not to say that, hey, the barbarians are at the gate, let's deal with them, let's do something. That's the point that we are in this life where we have the first era still, we need the expert to expert. There are plenty of stuff that it's really critical to have this expert data and, and what we call authoritative data. But at the same time, we have also the citizen science data. And harmonizing it and bringing it together is going to be a fairly challenge. So if you want to see more about that, uh, we're just publishing a report for the World Bank within a week, the next week. And that one looks at 29 case studies of crowdsourcing this type of both geographical information and of citizen science in government. Look at success factors, look at challenges, look at lessons, and you can find already some information on this uh, URL if you go and you find it, and that's where we also will publish the report. And there are really interesting lessons, some of them going back to the early lessons about GIS implementation. So to summarize what I was trying to say, is that citizens produced environmental information is on the rise and will continue to rise. And because of all the available tools, it will go in different ways. You can't just force it to become into one shape. It will come in multiple shapes. It's heterogeneous. It's temporal and spatial variability. There will be multiple sources. How we deal with that and how we integrate it, because what it turned out, that also a lot of environmental observation that we always relied on came from citizen science. We used to ignore it and decide that if it came through scientists that, that vetted it, that's fine. But bird does, for example, across Europe are critical for observation about bird pattern. And they have a very specific spatial pattern. For example, weekend bias, which means that a bird there is more likely to do observation over a weekend. Not a surprising thing, but once you know that that's a citizen science data, that needs to be part of your analysis and part of your understanding of it. We need to understand that there are different procedures, there are different organizational structure, there are different practices that are going on, and those all considerations that we'll need to figure out within data management of this information. Now, that's an interesting challenge. I wouldn't say that that's invalidate anything or make things irrelevant. That's not the point of my presentation. So no Inspire expert was harmed during the preparation of this presentation, I promise you. Uh, and the point is that it's an interesting challenge that we'll need to uh, understand and work through. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Muki, to open up our discussion also a little bit, since the session had also this information label in the headline to, to reflecting the new things which, happening, which are happening while we see the social and cultural challenges and changes in our society. Now, initially, we had the plan to have a plenary discussion, and I've looked at the watch, and I think that can't really happen. So what I, what I dare to do is uh, I'll, I dare to summarize five key points which I identified from you as points where you emphasized on that uh, it's very important to strengthen this maybe in the Inspire context. And then I give you the possibility to, to, to tell me that this was inappropriate or to, to, to reflect on this. So, and those points pretty much came through in most of the presentation. And one of the points is open data being important. We may have to address this further. Licensing issues has been mentioned at least two presentations is an issue. Coordination. We still have to do more on coordination. That was coming even from the well-organized Danish presentation from the start, that we're not quite there yet where we want to be. Be needs-driven. Look at real use cases. We have done that a few years ago, looking at use cases. Maybe those use cases are not so relevant anymore. Maybe we have to revisit these things. So let's be more needs-driven even. Communication. 
communication is very important. We have other communities out there which, which, which match up with Inspire, which we bring in through big projects like the European Union Location Framework, for example, and we have to share best practice of our implementations and so on. And Muki gave, us, gave me a fifth point, uh, which is about, let's say, fusioning of data. I mean, citizen, the citizen as a new kind of sensor. I mean, the sensor discussion is all over. So, so citizen as a sensor, this has a value. And the citizen has also a value on helping with the data quality, I think. We have been partly addressing this in the earlier session, that not everything may be fresh and finished with data quality and inspire. So I think if we emphasize the citizen aspect, that could help us a bit on that. These were the five key points I was taking from those four presentations. And I would like to go around here the, the row and ask you, is that a proper reflection? Maybe you add something. Please go ahead, Jens. Thank you very much. I think uh, the summarization is uh, very good. If I may add another one, I think uh, uh, you, you may recognize that Inspire holds a, a very big resource, very many high quality data, many methods of very high value for the rest of society. But I think in, in the business cases and the communication, you may consider going a step further and offer uh, Inspire as a partner. Because everywhere you look in society, if you see a big uh, business transformation in the agricultural area or in the transportation sector or anywhere, anywhere, there is a data management project underneath. You do, not, you do not make business transformation without data management. You have a unique resource and very often your data will be or could be play a very big part of it. And I think when go talking about partnership, it's not just about advertising. We have good stuff, come to us, but offer yourself as a partner, understand the needs, negotiate the needs, because the transportation sector probably is overlooking something, uh, maybe uh, enticed to change their needs, and also could tell you what you need to improve in order to make this business transformation work. So, inspire as a partner in, in societal transformation. Thanks a lot, Jens. Jamila? Yes. Uh, thank you. I would agree with, with, uh, with your uh, summary. I would emphasize the, the point regarding communication, because I think the, this is the very uh, important point just uh, to communicate with our users, which uh, I realized from my long term uh, knowledge. Uh, Working in, in the working in the public uh, for the public authorities and, and working with with users and, and the public providing uh, environmental information and sometimes you users don't ask for the information just because they don't know what is available so they, they really don't, don't don't know that so all the sources all the, the things are available so they don't ask. And we, we, don't, we think that they, they don't need information, they're not necessary, but they are necessary. We have to somehow to advertise uh, all the work we, we did, and then, then we will see uh, how our users will, will ask for them. So Thank you, Jamila. Uh, Johannes? Yeah, um, I totally agree with uh, your five points uh, you've already made. And uh, I would uh, like to add another one as well. Um, I think one of the important things is uh, to make the use of Inspire and uh, the whole thing to work with Inspire, to make that far easier. It's, it's, uh, to work with Inspire at this stage is uh, quite complicated and is, it's, it is something which is only, or is, in most cases, is only been done by some experts. And uh, not in any case you have experts available. This, we are dealing with, with, with data which should go into the public. It should be easy accessible. It should be easy to provide data. So we're coming back to the communication thing as well. So it should be quite easy to, to provide da uh, data to a system like Inspire. And uh, I think that is quite important to make these things easier and uh, bring that more into a mainstream uh, as, 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 uh, as a new thing. Thank you, Johannes. Muki? Um, and regarding the point that you raised from my talk, I would say that, that it's wrong just to view the citizen as a sensor. We need to think about 
the, the citizens as partners in data creation, as you said, with the quality, which is spot on. But what, what does it mean to actually the experts who are creating the data and managing it is that people would like to do these things. Who would think that, that in 10 years, you know, a project that started continue to create maps all over the world and do things like that. The, the potential is out there, and it should be that, that different experts should start thinking of themselves as facilitators of these activities. Thank you. I mean, you're absolutely right. I would like to, sorry, of course, I mean, we were just encouraged here about participation of citizens, but I mean, you will certainly understand that we cannot go into the round of questions now to the audience. I apologize for that. We will have probably a second opportunity tomorrow in, 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 in the next plenary session to come up with burning questions. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists very much. I would like to thank the patient audience. And I have a partnership, -ish, a partnership point here. And one of our uh, strong partners in Inspire would like to make a little announcement here. And i try to be helpful on that Stefan, announcement. Stefan, don't here worry about the slides. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dave Lovell, Executive Director of Eurogeographics, the association that represents 60 national mapping and cadastral authorities in Europe. And looking around the audience, I can see many people who've been to many Inspire conferences I've got a well-kept secret that I want to reveal to you. Today is the most exciting Inspire conference ever. I know that because the executive director of FGDC has come all this way to see what's going to happen next. And somewhere in the room, I think, is Ed Parsons, and I think he's come here also to see the most exciting thing that's happened to Inspire yet. Because today, Inspire gets taken to the next level and immediately after this session is closed, the launch will happen of the European Location Framework that takes Inspire to the next level. If you heard um, Ivan Deloach's presentation this morning, this is the geospatial platform for Europe, and you are all part of it. Please join us before you have lunch, because going without lunch for another five or ten minutes won't kill you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for encouraging this uh, contribution, and uh, please take a look, and that's how it looks like in the moment. Uh, in a few minutes, it looks different, I think. Crowded. Have a nice lunch, everybody. Two o'clock, there are parallel sessions. I understand there are the floor up, up, up here.